Hello, everybody. This is Ian here from ENJ Music, and today I'm doing my first of a 16 part tutorial series on basic sound design, including topics like sound, synthesis, sampling, effects, sound processing, all sorts of stuff. It's going to be a great series, and this is where it all starts. If you're new to sound design, this is something that will definitely help get you into the mindset of a sound designer and also give you a good amount of knowledge to start off with when you're trying to make music. So to start this whole series off, I'm going to talk about the most essential part of sound design, sound. And there's no better way to start talking about sound than with waves. That's just how sound works. So it, it really doesn't make sense to ignore the wave part of it. And the way that sound travels through air is called a longitudinal wave. These are some science terms. I'm going to try to stray a little bit away from too much science, but I do want to get a little bit into the technical side just so that you understand how this all works. The longitudinal waves, how they work is they travel in the same direction as the sound wave. They carry the sound information with these strips of closer together and further apart air. And that's what you're seeing with the closer together and further apart lines. Those are representing the air. Um, I know it, that's not how air actually looks. If that's how air looks to you, you might be tripping. Uh, but, but it's a good way to show it in a diagram. So, so that's why I did that. I've also got the transverse wave below, and that is waves that go back and forth along the way that the wave is traveling. And that's how we represent waves in sound design and sound editing. That's what a waveform is. It's basically a transverse wave showing what the wave is doing, its voltage values. It's useful for telling the speakers to pull the speaker cone inwards and make a thinner pocket of air or to push the speaker cone out and make a more pushed together pocket of air. And the way this works is there's a little magnet attached behind the speaker cone in every speaker and the electricity just runs through the magnet and through a little setup that I'm not going to go into it makes the magnet push outwards or inwards depending on the voltage. And when the wave goes up, there's positive voltage, so the speaker's pushed out. And when the wave goes down below into the negative voltage, the speaker is pulled in. So that's how you get those thicker and thinner regions of air coming from a completely different looking waveform, the transverse wave. Here I'm just labeling the compression area, which is the name for the closer together air particles, and the rarefaction area, which is the region of the stretched apart air particles. You don't have to remember these names, but I wanted to address them just so the science people aren't going to breathe down my neck about this. They probably still are. They're going to be like, Ian, you, you didn't do that right. It's not how science works. I'm going to be like, that's how sound works. That wasn't even... Uh, it, it, probably like a couple days later, I'd think of a good comeback. Now, after that tangent, we've got to dive right into what the basic five waveforms look like in sound design. So to start off, here's a picture of the speaker with some air in front of it. I know it just looks like blue dots, but I swear it's air. It, just put your face up against the screen. Breathe it, it's air. Good, all right. I hope you did that at your home, wherever you're watching this video. Okay, so below, you can see that there's no signal. There's no electricity going through the speaker, so the air is stationary. There's no sound information traveling from the speaker 
to your ears through the air. But once we introduce a signal like this beautiful sine wave, you get points of compression and rarefaction. A sine wave is the simplest waveform in existence. It's, it's like an essential part of every sound. And the sine wave sounds pretty boring on its own, but it's very important. Here's what it sounds like. All right, wasn't that awful? Yeah, it was awful. That's what I would hear if I could hear you yelling at me through your screen. Next up, we've got the triangle wave. It's like the sine wave, but it's a little pointier, as you can see. And it sounds a little bit warmer, too. Here's what this one sounds like. After that, we've got one of my favorites, the square wave. Look at that. It's just all oh, the hard corners. It's like, it's like 50s Russian architecture. Yeah. Yeah, that. Anyways, it's called a square wave because it looks kind of squarey. It's like two half boxes, one right side up and then the next upside down. Basically, this makes a really nice, round, thick, fat tone. Here's what a basic square wave sounds like. I mean, come on, isn't that, isn't that great? It's a pretty good wave right there, if I, if I do say so myself. Next up, we've got the pulse wave, which is a lot like a square wave. They're actually related. I'll talk about that in a minute. But the pulse wave is kind of skewed to one side, and it sounds a lot more sort of nasally and higher up than a square wave. Here's what a pulse wave sounds like. Isn't that gross? It's gross. It sounds like someone's nose. Just like a nose. It's what it's, it's what the sound is. Anyways, the way we talk about pulse waves is with a word called duty cycle. Sorry, that's two words. Two words called duty cycle. And it's pretty simple. It's just what percentage of the wave is at the top plateau. So in this pulse wave that you just heard, the duty cycle is around 20%, and you get that sort of nasally effect. But with a square wave, the duty cycle is 50%, and that's how they're related. A square wave is just a type of pulse wave, but it has to have 50% duty cycle, or it's not quite a square wave. 49% not a square wave. 51% not a square wave. 50% square wave. It's kind of like the whole square rectangle thing. A square is a type of rectangle, but a rectangle isn't always a square. Same thing here. Square wave is a pulse wave, but a pulse wave is not always a square wave. Hope it's a good analogy. They, they both have the word square in them. Just to finish talking about the square and the pulse wave, here is what it sounds like when you morph from a 20% duty cycle pulse wave to a 50% duty cycle pulse wave, also known as a square wave. So you can sort of hear in this example all of the sounds in between, just for reference. Isn't that cool? It's pretty cool. I think it's cool. If you don't think it's cool, you will think it's cool when we start doing synthesis. Moving on to the last basic waveform, the sawtooth wave. Most people call it the saw wave or just the saw. It's a shorter word. No one likes saying the extra syllables. Uh, so there you go. That's what the kids are saying these days. It's definitely the, the richest of all the basic waveforms. It's got a whole lot of content in it. Here's what it sounds like. It's kind of, it's kind of, harsh but but here it is all right now really listen to it great now just to wrap this part up here are the five basic waveforms for you the sine the triangle the sawtooth the square and the closely related pulse wave finally we've got full waveforms the waveforms we've been seeing so far are single cycle waveforms. They're just one part 
of the repeating waveform. So when you actually listen to those waveform examples that I played for you, that wasn't just one, that was that waveform repeated so many times at such a quick rate that it sounded like the sound that you heard. But when you add all of those waves up, you get what I like to call a full waveform. It's sort of the overall waveform over time of a sound. And you've probably seen these before if you've been on SoundCloud, that uh, the visualization of the music uh, where the, the orange thing fills up the, the weird, like, spiky thing. Uh, that, the spiky thing, is the waveform. That's sort of the way zoomed out version of what the whole sound looks like, just going up and down and up and down over and over millions of times to make the sounds you hear in every piece of music ever recorded. Now, you've probably also seen this if you've used Audacity at all. It's a basic audio editor. It's free. You should definitely pick it up if you're looking to do some basic sound editing. But in Audacity, you can also see the waveforms. And the great thing about it is you can zoom in back to the simplicity of those single cycle waveforms. But when you zoom in on waveforms in music, this is a guitar track here, you see all these complicated ones. That's not a saw, that's not a square, that's not a triangle, that's that's a weird pointy slope back up, cliff down, pointy again waveform. And when you listen to recorded music, it's got all these complicated waves that just morph and change over time. You can see that, that each repeat of this single cycle waveform every time just changes and it's got different points and that's what makes music so so nice to the ear is because it, all the sounds change over time the instruments don't just stay at the same waveform and when we get into synthesis we'll be able to use that and change sounds over time to make them sound great that's all for this video Next time, I'll be talking about digital audio and different properties associated with it, and that'll lead into other discussions that'll quickly get us to synthesis so you can start making your own sounds. This has been the first video of a 16-part sound design series. This is Ian from ENJ Music signing out. Hope you enjoyed. Hope you learned something. Stay tuned for the next video.